And welcome, everyone, to uh, this next debate here. We have Ted Reese back for another debate. He's going to be uh, de debating Sam Kangaroo this time. And, uh, but this time it's going to be a little bit different. We're going for two hours, and we have a little bit more of a structured and debate. Welcome, oh, everyone, to uh, this next debate here. We have Ted Reese back for it's another debate, uh, de issues. debating Sam oh. Kangaroo this time. And uh, nope, but nope. this and, time it's uh, going to be a little bit different. We're going for two hours, and we have a little bit oh, more of a structured and debate. Welcome, oh, everyone, to. So uh, sorry, there we go. <laughs> My bad. Uh, okay, First yeah, we have, debate, debate, uh, uh, we have a more of a structured debate Sam this time. Sam uh, this time. And we're going to be debating the, the, debating the question of the future of socialism and talking about modern monetary theory versus uh, Marxist economics and anarchism or Marxism to get there. All right, so um, before we get going, let's do a, uh, should we do the coin flip now or, uh, or later? What do you guys think? Uh, I, would, I would be happy for Sam to go first. Okay. We'll, uh, we'll start with Sam and um, we're going to do one, uh, we're going to start with one minute introductions each and then head into opening statements and then we'll get into the questions. I have the timer here on screen. I'll let you guys know when uh, you're down to about a minute each on each of the sections. But uh, Sam, let's, uh, let's just let you introduce yourself first <clears throat> and go for it. Hi, I'm Sam Kangaroo. <clears throat> I'm a modern monetary theory proponent. In my parliamentary life, you could say I'm a progressive. Philosophical underpinnings of my ideological belief system are that of Aryan socialism, which is, for many of the audience know, just a polite term for anarchism. I've worked for progressive political campaigns in and without the Democratic Party. I've worked with various movements to teach modern monetary theory as a way of advancing society past current hazards that we face, some of the current impediments, which are unnecessary in the way they've been typically framed. And a lot of, by trade, I'm a project manager, and I've worked in the private sector as well as social sciences think tanks, a lot of consulting in that regard. All right, that's your minute. Okay, uh, and uh, Ted, you got a minute here for your, uh, just introduce yourself. Hi, thanks for having me on again. Um, I'm Ted Rees, um, I'm a Marxist in Britain, and I've recently published the book, Socialism or Extinction, Climate Automation and War in the Final Capitalist Breakdown. Um, I'm a political activist as well here in, in, in Britain. And my book argues that capitalism is entering its final breakdown, um, that automation is effectively the uh, last expression of capitalist development and is abolishing the source of profit, which is commodity producing human labor. Okay, uh, before we move on to the opening statements chat, I'm just going to let you know to, uh, if you have questions, you can type them in um, because we're going to be answering questions uh, at the end for about 10 minutes. Maybe if we have more time, we'll, we'll do more. But just, uh, yeah, r remember to, to, to ask away if anything comes up. Um, okay, so let's get going with our opening statements. And Sam, you have five minutes starting. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bounce that one back to Ted since... He had me uh, start the introductions. I'd be happy to have Ted start the opening statement. Uh, sure. Um, well, wait a minute. We do have you programmed for, uh, set to do the the opening because I mean, no, you, are, you, you, <laughs> you did you are critiquing his book. So let's 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 start with you, Sam. Okay, fair enough. So let me start by saying uh, I really like the title of Ted's book. Socialism or extinction. I think that is exactly the options that we should be considering. We are living in dire times, dire economic times, dire social times, potentially, potentially dire times for capitalism. We are faced with a culmination of challenges, crises and potential crises that are unprecedented in human history. The question then is, 
as Dr. King put it, where do we go from here? Or to invoke Lenin, despite my being an anti-Leninist, what is to be done? Through this debate, I hope to demonstrate that we have solutions sitting on the shelf, solutions that if fully leveraged using the social, economic, and political tools at our disposal, will widen our imaginative horizons, creating not only a better, more sustainable future for humanity in the immediate future, but also create the conditions by which we can more fully realize the potential of each and every human paradigm shift led by a shift in consciousness led by an understanding for how we can improve material conditions in constructive putting environmentally constructive ways as opposed to the destructive ways which we find humanity currently engaged with respect to my differences with ted in that regard but to convince those listening that his tactics for achieving a strategy with which we have many things in common are not only less viable than my own less desirable in what they are likely to produce as outcome. With respect to the economic means by which we bring about change, I hope to pursue to persuade those listening that much much of Ted's understanding for what indicates that capitalism is in crisis, warning signs on the road, if you will, are exactly backwards. And based on fundamental misunderstandings, implications of key economic indicators and metrics. By explaining the operational realities of certain economic policies, I hope that by the end of this debate, the audience will agree, or at least be compelled enough to do their own further due diligence to investigate what it is I will be explaining and describing about those operational realities and how they function. Okay, great. Uh, that gave us a couple minutes left too, to uh, save for later. So Ted, your five minute opener starts now. Okay, so um, the reason um, I see capitalism going into its final crisis at the moment is because it's basically coming up against a sort of historical maximum or limit uh, in terms of capital accumulation. Um, the world's workforce has now been more or less deindustrialized and that indicates in itself that, you know, it's no co coincidence that, that as that has happened, we've now gone into the deepest crisis that captains have ever faced. Um, and this would show to me, you know, is a, is a pretty strong indicator that Marx was right in terms of what would happen to capitalism eventually in terms of working towards its own disillusion, in terms of the capital's exploitation of the working class um, basically not being sustainable it, it, it's it's abolishing that in it in itself um, i don't think uh, mmt in terms explains of explains working to these phenomena um, the problem which we'll get into the, the roots of it, but the problem is it sees the state as the capitalist state as a sort of the starting point of everything, um, political, economic, and social. And that's not the case. Um, I would argue that it starts with the private ownership of the means of production and, and um, the classes that society is divided into as a result. Uh, and and therefore the state sort of arises from that and acts um, on behalf of the capitalists and the ruling class. Um, so that's my first criticism of MNT, um, but we'll we'll get more into that as we go on. Okay, that's uh, all right. We're we're uh, that's, we saved another two minutes there as well. Um... So, all right, well then why don't we just skip right ahead to uh, Sam and you can explain what MMT is and what it isn't. And uh, I'll give you seven minutes for that. Yeah, uh, before we go into that, I'd, I'd like to just, you know, I've broken that down into subsections there. I'd like to start with what is money and what are its origins. Oh, um, I'll, oh I didn't see uh, that. Oh, okay, right, gotcha. Yes, 
I skipped ahead. Right. My bad. Let's go to, yeah, what is money and its origin? Sorry, I didn't see that. Uh, right. Four minutes to you, Sam. Right. So I'll give my explanation for it and uh, what I MMT demonstrates money to be, and it's not entirely new concept of what money is. It's derived from the chartalist, what's called the chartalist view of money. Um, and then I'd like to hear what Ted's views are of money and then have a little bit of a discussion back and forth with each other about that. But let me get started by saying if you investigate the origins of money, as Keynes did long ago, as David Graeber, who many in your audience will know, as more recently, his book, Debt, The First 5,000 Years, <clears throat> you can go back at least that long and find that the evidence for money always having been tied to a weight unit is overwhelming. Pound, the lira, echo. This came out of record keeping. It came out of record keeping by authorities. The authority forces the payment of the thing that must be rendered, pay the liabilities that the citizenry has to the authority because the authority has imposed a liability. For example, in the case of a state, it would be a tax. In the case of a religious authority was often fined for harming another member of the religious community. So MMT accepts the chartless view of money and currency. A couple of points. One, money is a social unit of account. Therefore, it is record. Second thing is that it is debt. Money is in and of itself debt because it is a promise to pay. In the case of a pegged currency, a promise to pay the commodity or currency to which that currency is pegged, whatever rate it's pegged at. In the case of a fiat currency, it is a promise to pay the money itself, nothing more, nothing less. Money is the debt of the issuer. Whoever issues money, that is the debt of that entity. So the government must accept it back, if we're talking about government as the issuing, of, must accept it back in payment of any debt to the issuer. So what is currency? Currency is the debt of a government. This also means that a bank deposit, the debt of a bank. When you make a deposit at your bank for however many dollars, doesn't matter if you did it in cash, doesn't matter if it was a direct deposit, doesn't matter if you wrote a check, Money in that account as a result, your account, now literally, not theoretically, but literally the debt of your bank. So read what is, I'll give you more evidence for this. I'll give you a really simple test. Read what is actually written on the currency. Take a UK pound note, the picture of the queen. It says what? I promise to pay the bearer on demand the sum of five pounds. So if you take that note to the queen, she doesn't promise to pay you a certain amount of gold or silver or exchange that five pound note for anything else but another five pound note. Third thing, this is a little bit more complicated and I'll flesh it out a little bit now and it'll also come up likely later throughout our conversation. So one, money is a social unit of account, Four therefore it is record keeping, it is debt, Three, it's a tax credit. Can I get two more minutes? I'm happy to extend time to uh, Ted sure. in addition at some point. Great. <clears throat> Anyone can issue money. The problem is getting that money accepted. So in case you guys didn't hear that third thing. So one, it's a social unit of account. Two, it is debt. Three, it is a tax credit. And I understand that that is not um, self-evident. And I'm going to flesh that out as we go along in a little bit in a second. So it originated out of punishment taxes and fines it did not come out out of the market okay that is the barter view or the barter origin of money which is a myth taxes and fines are not what the government needs to finance itself the liability that it, that it imposes so that it can provision itself and the fiat currency has value in exchange because of sovereign of the sovereign power to levy taxes on economic activity payable currency that the sovereign issues so in the case of a government it has value 
only in exchange because the power, because the sovereign power says, when we levy taxes, you can use that currency to pay those taxes. That's what allows it to gain acceptance. That is what backs money, a tax obligation you have to the state, the tax obligation you have to the state, which states impose so that they can provision themselves by moving resources, land, labor, capital, machinery sense when I say capital, the public sector. Otherwise, what good is the government? And why would anyone confer legitimacy or authority onto it if it can't provide for the common good, roads, bridges, etc.? all of which require land, labor, and capital machinery to build, none of which are financed by taxpayer dollars and monetary sovereign, which is a cliffhanger that uh, I'll leave for now and I'll explore later on as I go into my explanation of MMT. All right, thank you. Uh, Ted, I'll give you an extra two minutes here if you want to reply a bit longer. It'll give you five. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, go for it. Okay, so money. Marx writes that money arose historically out of, necess out of the necessary conditions of exchange, so uh, exchange of commodities. Um, so you have all of these different things that are produced by privately owned uh, production, owned by capitalists, and they all, every commodity embodies um, a certain amount of exchange value and that exchange value um, represents the amount of labour that was needed to produce it in total. So if it's a commodity, if it's a, an unfinished commodity, if it's like a, um, a primary commodity used in production, the amount of labor that went into it in terms of labor time would would um, equate roughly to how much it costs in the real world now that's an abstraction so mark mark starts with the commodity the, the the real world of commodities extract abstracts from that and he shows that all of the, if you took the total cost of all commodities, they would equal the total amount of socially necessary labor. So all the commodities embody all of the labor that it took to produce them. Uh, and then he goes back to the concrete and, um, the, you sees that these commodities have to be exchanged between by different people who have no who without money would have no means of exchanging them other than barter. So money arises necessarily as the universal um, the universal unit of exchange, um, and that's the that's the marx that's roughly more or less the marxist explanation for where from where money comes from it's not so yeah the, the capitalist state controls the issue of money absolutely um but it doesn't just in it didn't just invent it i don't think you know for to to punish um and to to keep people in check and to, and all the rest of it, it's a necessary phenomenon that arises out of of um, of, of commodity production and the exchange exchange of commodities. So, yeah, let me respond to that. So I, I definitely did not say that uh, it was created by the state to begin with. I said an authority. And going back five thousand years, that authority was typically religious community communities, religious leaders, sort of authority over their flock. In the case of the state issuing a currency, okay, first and foremost is to provision itself. It needs resources in order to be legitimized. In order to get those resources, it has to get people to work for it. To do that, it levies a tax. This is why, among the other two things I mentioned, a social unit of account and 
in and of itself debt, money is also a tax credit, something that you can use to pay your taxes. If we go back 5,000 years, I mean the capitalists. And by the way, just so the audience is clear, what Ted described is the barter story of money, which as I'm claiming is a myth. And anyone wants to investigate the, the very deep anthropological work that's been done by David Graeber, also a chart lists for 100 years on this, they can. For the UK audience, you might be familiar with tally sticks. That's a really good example of how ta the tally stick was an excellent example of how money was derived, used by the crown authority to keep track for record keeping. Okay? But that only comes into existence because there is some sort of fine tax levy either by a king or by a government or by whatever authority existed at the time, including the religious authorities and religious communities. But to pose a question to Ted, give me an example of how this could have come out through capitalism 5,000 years ago. Ted? <laughs> But I mean, I, I, I don't know. I mean, it's, I've studied capitalism, and uh, not the whole history of economics. Um, and Mar Marx, Marx writes that um, the gold was the, the necessary universal uh, unit of exchange. So gold is the money commodity. Um, I can't give you, I can't go into all the explanations of how society worked 5,000 years ago. I, I'm dealing with how capitalism works now and how, how it's been, how it's been working for the Luckily. last 100 years and how, how it's developing into the crisis that it's developing into now. Um, you know. Luckily we have an archeological record that demonstrates on any reasonable doubt, money predates its writing. We have the etchings of humans, human civilizations 5,000 years ago where they were keeping track of exchange. The archaeological evidence for it is overwhelming. Why I think this matters is it's important as a foundation for our future, the rest of this discussion, have uh, the audience know what our different views on money are because they're going to uh, affect and they do inform the critique of capitalism and where he thinks it's headed as well as my critique um, of his book and his work. Uh, okay, Ted, if you want to take another uh, three minutes um, we, uh, to respond, that's okay. And then we'll go, we're going to move on to what MMT actually is and isn't after this. Okay, so yeah, um, money has existed for a long time. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, it's just we're dealing with um, we're dealing with capitalism and how it came into existence. Uh, sure, money existed before it, but I, and money has always served as a as an, a unit of exchange um but we're, we're now when we're talking about capitalism we're talking about sort of small commodity production sort of um growing and 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 developing into mass production and and all the rest of it and industrialization and then becoming a sort of global phenomenon so Certainly, capitalism has only existed for five hundred years, and I don't, I don't think we're disputing that. But um, as far as capitalism is concerned, money is necessary because of the private means of production and and the exchange of commodities on the market. Okay. Well, let's get into a bit more of the meat of it here and I'll let Sam start with, okay, you want a 12 minutes here. Okay. Uh, for what MMT actually is and what it isn't. So this, this should be good. All right, Sam, 
your 12 minutes starts now. Great. So what I want to start with are a couple of key things about what MMT is not. So whenever you hear about MMT, please keep these things in mind about what it is not. Okay. MMT is not a political project. MMT does not offer any policy prescriptions, none, zero. There are MMT economists, MMT proponents of all political stripes that have a whole host of different prescriptions that they prefer, that they suggest, that they offer based on their political leaning. MMT is not inherently liberal, conservative, progressive, Marxist, populist right wing, populist left wing, fascist, or anything else. It is a thoroughly empirical project, which means that one can, gra can graft a whole host of ideologies, such as the ones I mentioned, and political preferences onto it. It can be leveraged by literally all of those political ideologies, which poses in it a potential danger in and of itself, which I'll get to at some point when we talk about what my own personal uh, criticisms of MMT are. So what is MMT? Well, it stands for modern monetary theory. First of all, I have to clear this bit up. Um, there is virtually nothing theoretical in modern monetary theory. Why then is it called modern monetary theory? This is um, the result of very poor marketing. When something gets into the water supply and sticks, especially by someone outside of a movement that popularizes a term referring to something, none of the tenets, principles of MMT, none of the descriptions are theoretical. The theoretical area of MMT is one that pertains and applies to all economic schools of thought. That is this theory of inflation. I personally happen to think it's more sophisticated than any other school of economic thought that has come before it, including that of Marxism. Aside from that, there is nothing theoretical about MMT. None of its fundamental, fundamental tenets are theoretical, but rather empirical. Okay? So with that in mind, MMT is a description of monetary and fiscal operations that apply to a monetary sovereign, okay? Now, what the heck is a monetary sovereign, right? A monetary sovereign is defined by four criteria, okay? It is a nation state that, one, issues its own currency. Two, must not be borrowing a foreign currency. Three, must not be taxing its population in any currency other than its own. Four, lets its currency float. Therefore, the currency isn't pegged to anything, it's not pegged to gold, it's not pegged to silver, it's not pegged to another currency. So I want to give everyone a short list of countries that are monetary sovereigns right now in the world. Okay? And by saying that, I'm also saying, therefore, they are already operating way MMT describes, United States, Canada, Japan, Australia, Sweden, Norway, Finland, Denmark, and many others. You may have noticed that I didn't mention any of the countries in the Eurozone. There's a good reason for that. Why they cannot be counted as monetary sovereigns. I'll get into that as I go into the explanation. In the case of the United States, <clears throat> which for dogmatic, and this is important, I bring it up not just because I'm in the U.S. and I'm an American, but also because according to dogmatic Marxist theory, depending on how dogmatic one's Marxism is, uh, the revolution has happened in the most advanced industrialized nation uh, in the world. Yeah. Uh, at this day and age, it's the United States. Um, at other points in time, it was Germany. In fact, it was Germany that Marx had in mind um, when he conceived of that notion. So in the case of the United States, this economy has been operating on what MMT describes since 1934. That's, now, why since 1934? That's when Franklin Roosevelt ended domestic convertibility of gold. That's when he suspended the gold standard. Okay? 
And for those who are curious, international convertibility of gold ended with the Nixon shock of 1974. But what does MMT describe about fiscal and monetary operations of a monetary sovereign? And why is it so profoundly important for people to understand this? First, as I demonstrated in What is Money? Money is a creature of the state. It is a creature of some governing authority, religious, nation state, or otherwise. And most importantly, which is something we haven't heard at address yet, is that consummated in law. I'm not sure if Ted um, would agree that not only is money consummated in law, but that capitalism itself requires legal system, a groundwork of rules in order to operate. <clears throat> when Congress or any other legislative body, monetary sovereign, passes an appropriations bill, therefore a spending bill, they are authorizing new spending. And I want everyone to listen closely to what happens here operationally. Okay? The Treasury, <clears throat> after Congress or the legislative body has authorized that spending, Treasury spends the money. Central bank clears that spending. How do they do it? They're not printing money. This is 2020. They're not printing money. They are digitally marking up the appropriate accounts to which that spending has been allocated on a computer. Money in a modern economy is literally, nothing theoretical about this, is literally keyboarded into existence. How did... MMT economists figured this out. Well, one of the things they did was they actually bothered to talk to mid-level bureaucrats at the Federal Reserve, something that until very recently, until the crisis in 2008, 2009, something that since the neoliberal period of 19, late 1970s, mid to late 1970s, had never been done before until that financial crisis in 2008, 2009 by the Federal uh, Open Market Committee of the Federal Reserve. Now, what is that? Those are the political appointees, include the chairman of the Federal Reserve, and uh, depending on your views of them, his, you know, his, uh, I, his, his or her sidekicks, right? the other board members, including the chairman of the Federal Reserve. The political appointees in the, of the FOMC have been profoundly ignorant about the own monetary and fiscal operations of the countries in which they're supposed to be managing the central bank. I know that's astonishing, and we'll get into why that is a little bit further on, but I'm afraid that that is the reality. Never assume conspiracy when ignorance or incompetence will serve as, um, as a rational explanation first, okay? If that satisfies the criteria for how something could have come about, start there before you move on to concerted effort. I think that's a rational way of approaching it. Um, so what happens then with bonds? What is this with taxation? Why do we tax? Uh, what are you saying, Sam? Are you saying taxes don't fund government spending? Yes. First and foremost, that is what I'm saying, is that the federal government of any monetary sovereign is not revenue constrained in its spending at all, period, full stop. It does not finance its spending through the issuing of bonds or through taxation. The case of the United States, as I mentioned, that has been the case since 1934, okay? So why then are there all of these outstanding treasury bonds, these also known as treasury securities, that are equal to the national debt countries, in the case of the United States, that of a certain amount, and there have been treasury bonds issued in exactly that amount, to the penny. Who's holding them? Who's holding the majority of them, right? Yes, private households, the private sector, some firms do hold some of these bonds, but nowhere in the universe of the amount of the total amount of debt. Yes, foreigners hold some of them, but again, nowhere near the extent to the size of the national debt. So where is it most of it being held and why? Most of it is being held by the central bank. In the case of the United States, 
Federal Reserve. This begs the question, if they don't need the bonds to finance spending, why do they buy bonds from the Treasury every time the Treasury spends? Isn't this a 12-minute segment? Yep, two minutes left. Okay, okay. <laughs> the reason they do it is it's a holdover from the gold standard. They have to do it by policy. Okay? So every time the Treasury spends new money, the central bank has to, by policy, buy bonds of equal size. So that's spending. What happens operationally is this. The account of the Treasury, instead of being allowed to simply go negative, okay, is offset to the penny by the purchase of that bond. These are accounting identities. And this is what's important to understand. That unlike Marxism, Marxist economics, modern monetary theory is consistent. Double entry accounting principle. We're able to measure both sides of the balance sheet. Every asset, there is an equal liability. My assets are your liability. Your assets are my liability. Okay. <clears throat> so we're talking about literally shifting assets on a balance sheet. That's what those operations in terms of bond issuance <clears throat> boil down to. And I have a lot more to say on this, but um, we can get to it after Ted's response bring the discussion all right awesome okay ted uh, you wrote some of that down hopefully <laughs> all right your seven minutes is uh starting now okay the first point i want to come back on is the contention that marx um marx's position was that capitalism in the develop the most developed countries, the most developed capitalist countries would be the first to become socialist. I think that was his original um, position, um, but he later changed it somewhat. For example, he originally thought that there would need to be a working class revolution in England before there could be um, a national liberation in Ireland um, and he later changed his position uh, to one where he saw a national liberation and maybe even a socialist revolution being necessary to spark or inspire or you know be, to, to um, preempt a revolution in England. So that was an example of him not being dogmatic. I accept there are dogmatic Marxists, but Marxism shouldn't be dogmatic. Um, capitalism needs laws. Yep, absolutely. Um, money's backed by law. Yep, absolutely. Um, money is created electronically now. Absolutely. No, I've no contention with that. Um, um, the state is not constrained by revenue, um, that's true, but so tax, taxes do fund government spending, but obviously they need other sources as well because there's not enough tax coming in. Uh, the reason there's not enough taxes coming in is because um, as capitalist development uh, goes on the tenants the rate of the pro rate of profit as in general rate of profit so across the capitalist world uh, across a capitalist country the the rate of profit will tend to fall and as a result corporations and private companies need corporate they need the taxes to come down so they lobby the government very hard for tax cuts um, and obviously they have a lot of people basically in government anyway. Um, so taxes cut and then in the long run, so for a while that will boost profits and there won't be a problem, but then profit rate starts to fall again and the tax base is shrinking relatively. So you've got this problem where there's not enough, enough tax coming in for the, what the state needs to spend. So it has to turn to, the, to debt, basically. So the, the reason the central bank 
in the US and pretty much everywhere now is, is holding the, the vast majority of, of debt is because it's it's the one, it's the only, as the issuer of money, it's the only um, uh, institution that can buy all this debt. So what it's doing is, is buying debt from corporations so that corporations can stay viable so that they can stay um, afloat um, without because the thing is as the crisis of capitalism deepens um, competition intensifies all of the aspects of capitalism intensify and the circulation of capital has to speed up um, the turnover of cash flow intensifies so they need more money sooner quicker they've got to spend it quicker so on and so forth so this explains why we're seeing the state step in or, um, on such a such a drastic level. Um, for example, after the last crisis, there was only supposed to be two or three rounds of quantitative easing. They wanted to stop doing it, um, but they they couldn't. They tried, and it was, you know, it wasn't working. Corporations were going into crisis again, so they had to turn the taps back on. And this is a, this is a, a good example of of the needs of profit and accumulation, um, you know, ruling over everything ultimately. Um, so yeah, that's. That's my that, that's basically it. That's my explanation for that. Um, so, Stephen, I, I would like to expand the discussion part of this um, considerably longer. We are slated for um, five minutes. I think we're going to. Yeah, we're going to need at least 10. So I might not be able to convince Ted in rebuttal, but uh, I'm hoping that I will be able to convince enough of the audience. So I've taken notes on some of the things he said. Um, okay, so let me pose a question to Ted. Why would the currency issuer require the very thing that they are able to issue as much as they want of to finance spending? Sorry, can you repeat that? Absolutely. Why would the currency issuer, in the case of the United States, it's federal it's the treasury vis-a-vis -vis the, the federal reserve through the central bank okay, which is a consolidated unit they are both a part of the government the only independence the federal reserve has is in setting interest rate targets okay? mm -hmm. so why would the currency issuer acquire the very thing that they are able to issue as much as they want of why would they require that finance spending Again, why would the currency issuer require the very thing they are able to issue as much as they want of in order to finance spend it? You and I, what you just repeated is the household budget analogy of economics, which says you and I have to balance our checkbooks, otherwise we have to borrow. That's true, but you and I don't have a printing press. You and I are not able to keystroke dollars into an economy. OK, and the United States and the other monetary sovereigns I mentioned were bound by gold, by the quantity of gold that was backing their money. What you said had more validity. It did, because if you were reaching the threshold of the amount of gold you had in terms of what you've issued into the private economy, then yes, you will need some of that money back or you'll have to get more gold. Those are your only options. But when your currency is not pegged, another currency or to a precious commodity such as gold, why on earth would you need everything that you're able to issue unlimited amounts of in order to finance new spending? That's my question. So in theory, you're saying that the government could just spend what it needs to spend um, by issuing itself the money. Say that last part again. What I'm saying in theory is that the, the government can what? I'm sorry? The government could cover all of its spending needs just by issuing more money to itself. Ah, with, with what? One very serious constraint. 
The constraint is not revenue. The, the constraint is not bond issuance. The constraint, and this is not theory, you said in theory, it's, it's not in theory. It's right. how the United States has been operating all spending since 1934. It's how all of the countries I mentioned currently operate. MMT isn't advocating that we do this thing. We already do it. It's a question of how much you want to leverage it. It's how leveraged, how, how much do you want to take advantage of these operational realities? So I'm saying that, yes, the government can spend as much as it wants on as many goods and services as it wants and can invest as much as it wants up to a very important constraint. It's not the one that we've all come to think of, which is the revenue constraint. Okay? The constraint is inflation. Constraint is inflation. Okay. So when we talk about inflation, there are two different. Well, let me give you a chance to respond before I go any further. No, I I I agree that the constraint is inflation. But we've got to go back to where does value come from and the con the reason exploit labor if it if it could exploit labor on an unlimited basis then inflation wouldn't be a problem but that's obviously not possible because there's only so many hours in a day there's only is only so much energy a human being can exert each day in the workplace and so on and so forth so um Without, under capitalism, value is created by capital's exploitation of labor. That's the fundamental thing. So value is generated out of that. It's realized through the sale of commodities um, and private companies operate on that underlying basis. On the surface level, they operate on, on the basis of prices of production and profit, but that's the underlying basis um, ultimately. Uh, so without that, without that happening, money doesn't have value, right? And that's, that's why, and we'll get more into this, I'm sure, but that's why capitalism is now going into such a, a deep crisis because okay. it's not generating enough value um, to, to reproduce like the total value of total capital at the moment. So, uh, be, and, and this comes back to automation, like the more automated production becomes, the smaller the value creating component in the production process, which is human labor and its exploitation, the smaller that becomes, right? So the, the challenge of of the working class reproducing capital and expanding it becomes a, a more and more challenging, more and more difficult. And ultimately it, it reaches a stage where it becomes impossible. Um, and this is also why um, money has, uh, you know, devalued itself over the last century. So the US, in, in 2018, the US dollar had devalued, as in lost purchasing power, um, I think it was 96% since 1913. The, um, the uh, British pound sterling, as, as of 2011, had lost 99.5% of its purchasing power. Um, so we, we, can, we can see that the, there are very real processes happening and you have to be able to explain why that's happening. And if, Absolutely. if I, I'm not sure what, what your explanation of that is, but it, for me, it, go, it comes back to the, the process of capitalist development, diminishing the source of profit and the rate of profit falling as a result. And, and therefore less revenue is available to the state to fund its, its spending. So it has to get it from somewhere else, which is why we're now at, you know, 100% of national debt uh, and so on and so forth. So let me, let me say a, a couple of things on that. Um, circle back to what national debt and budget deficits are 
Um, and we'll talk a little bit about stock and flow variables and I'll explain those terms and how they relate and why I think it's such an important piece of what's missing from Ted's analysis in his book. First thing I want to do is just translate uh, a part of what Ted just said into um, modern economic terms. And that is to say that based on what Ted just said and what he's written in his book, he believes that demand is a function, but believes is faith-based. Let's say thinks. He says he thinks demand is a function of investment. In other words, investment occurs at spurs and generates demand. This is putting the cart before the horse. This is, in my view, in the view of not just MMTers, but Keynesians. And uh, for the record, I, I know I forgot to mention this earlier in case um, for those who are curious, you know, where does MMT fall into the school of thought of economics? Uh, MMT is post Keynesian. We are not a part of any neoclassical synthesis. We're not a part of any of the neoclassical schools of economic thought. We are not neo-Keynesians. We are post-Keynesians, okay? Which is one of the reasons, one of the many reasons that MMT attracts uh, so many anarchists. I was at the MMT conference, uh, annual conference last year. It was my first time at MMT conference, and I was uh, surprised, somewhat surprised, um, but delighted and ultimately gained further understanding, much less surprised, to find that many of the attendees were libertarian socialists, also libertarian socialists. We also had a number of Marxists at the conference. We had a number of conservatives, okay? We had a number of libertarians. We had many, many progressives. But like I said, this isn't a political project. You can graft onto it any number of political ideologies. So uh, what we would say is that investment is a function of demand. In other words, demand is what spurs investment, not the other way around. Investment by the private sector does not spur demand to begin with. To begin with, you need demand for goods and services. Let me make this really plain for everyone, because I know that some of this stuff can get very technical, very jargony, very confusing, and I know that not everyone has had, spent the, the time on these kind of, on these concepts and ideas and know certain basic econ terms and what have you. So if you own a firm, if you are a capitalist or you you run a business, you're in the private sector, you are not going to invest. What do we mean by invest? That means spend your money, your surplus, your savings, your accumulated surplus on l new land, labor, capital. You're not going to hire not going to purchase new land that you might need for development, for production. Not going to purchase uh, capital, which in the factors of production sense is machinery, unless there is demand for the product or service that you are going to create with these factors of production. So it starts with demand. Private sector will not invest. They have no reason to. Why would you produce a good or service that you're trying to render for a profit? if there's no demand for that good or service. So in this regard, I think it's important to point out in my view uh, that Ted has this exactly backward. Um, moving on to the question that I wanted to circle back to, um, or the element I wanted to circle back to rather, of uh, what is national debt? What are budget deficits, okay? So we have to first define what a stock and flow variable, right? Because the national debt is a stock variable Budget deficits are flow variables. This is important, and you'll, uh, I hope that what I, my explanation will illustrate why. A stock variable is a variable that, at any given point of time, have a number for it, have a unit for it, and it, typically it has accumulated over time. So the national debt, something you measure at any given point in time, and it has accumulated over history. Okay. In the case of a flow variable, it is something that is measured over an interval, right? So, for example, a, a budget deficit is something that is measured over the course of a year. So, a stock variable is the aggregate or accumulation, when they're associated, of a flow variable. So, what does that mean the national debt is? The national debt is the accumulation of every budget deficit 
It's the net sum of every budget deficit and surplus the United States has ever run since its inception, going all the way back to the late 1700s. Since yeah. the United States started, that is what the national debt represents, okay? Now, why is it absolutely no cause for concern? I'm going to tell you why. The reason it's no cause for concern is that when the United States, as I explained earlier, authorizes spending, it spends that money into existence. It spends that money into the private sector. The public sector, the government is spending money that winds up in the private sector, which means what is that money? Not theoretically, literally, what is that money? It is the net savings of the private sector. The national debt is nothing more than the debt stock savings of the United States, okay? The budget deficit, when, when the United States is running a budget deficit, a flow variable, what that means is that the private sector is also in, is in flow. <clears throat> when the United States is running a budget deficit, the private sector is in surplus, it's in flow surplus. It's not borrowing, it's not dipping into its savings. It's not dipping into its national debt. And by the way, these are accounting identities to the literally to the penny, which means that the national debt is to the penny, all of the money that the United States has spent into existence. And the United States is running a, a budget deficit for the year. The private sector is in surplus is in surplus. They're not having to dip into their savings. They are in net surplus to the penny as a matter of accounting identity. Right. Um, I want to send it back to Ted and, and then kind of keep going on with maybe a couple more minutes before we move on to the uh, sections of his book. Okay, I haven't said that um, investment doesn't happen without demand. What I've said is, like, obvious. That's obvious that you need demand. You, you wouldn't, you wouldn't um, invest in something if there's no demand for it. Um, it but it's dialectical. It's a two. It's a two-way thing. Um, there's, there's no, there's no investment if you can't sufficiently exploit labor is basically what it comes down to so what we're going to find the more with the more automation um that the, the productive system has is that more and more companies become unprofitable and as a result investors will pull out despite the fact that there is demand there is there is demand for food but if a food company goes bust, then the investors will will stop investing in it. Um, if the reason the re, if the reason for that is that it's the food is no longer wanted, then fine. But most of the time, that's not going to be the case. If we see um, if we see like big food companies going bust despite the fact that people um, want to buy its food, then that's evidence that demand does not, um, is not the key factor. Um, so uh, in terms of the, the, the deficit being equal to the savings, um, I mean, it comes back to the fact that eventually this is unsustainable. Um, you know, why, why, I mean, what, what if you do get hyperinflation, then what, you know, that all goes out the window in terms of accounting and everything. So we've, yeah, I, as, I think as I've stated, the, the, the currencies of nearly a hundred percent have nearly lost a hundred percent of their value. So why why is that? Uh, what what is lost one hundred percent of the value? Sorry, current fiat currency. Oh, currency. Yeah. The U.S. dollar and the and British pound sterling have lost nearly a hundred percent of their. So why why is that? What's the MMT explanation? Yeah, absolutely. So are you, are you taking a stock 
variable here or a flow variable? I mean, in, in what are you saying over the, co the course of their entire existence, they have depreciated by that much? Is that what you're saying? Hmm. Okay, but what about their purchasing power? That's the question that matters for inflation. So sure, I take your word for it, that uh, the value against what? Against what they're able to purchase, right? I mean, it costs more and more to buy the same thing. Okay, a Snickers bar now, well, I don't know what they have in the UK equivalent. I'm sure you have Snickers bars. A Snickers bar costs 10 times more than it did 50 years ago. So what? So what? My, the question is, have the wages kept up? Is inflation so, is there so much inflationary pressure that people can't purchase the goods and services that they need? Like, okay, so these things cost more. But they didn't cost more all at once. We didn't wake up tomorrow in the United States and all of a sudden a candy bar costs 10, 15, 20 times. This was over the course of an accumulative effect. So they're, they're gonna continue to cost more. In fact, a little bit of inflation is something you want in an economy. So much so, in fact, that the Federal Reserve is pulling its hair out trying to get a little inflation into the system. It's why we have zero interest rates. It's why they're doing the best that they can to try to avoid having to go to negative interest rates. Please let these zero percent, almost zero, almost zero percent interest rates create demand. Let them please create a little inflation. What they don't fully embrace yet, although they're starting to, we see that they're starting to come around, and I'll give examples of how. And Bernanke and even Alan Greenspan, you know, no ideological friends of mine, I'm sure not ideological friends of Ted's either, um, have ex publicly and explicitly um, expressed many of the tenets that I have that I have described and ex explained here today thus far. Um, but the idea that, uh, you know, we're in this inflationary period uh, or impending inflation period and nobody will be able to afford anything is, is ludicrous. Um, but what I really want to ask Ted, and I, I, and I like this discussion, I appreciate it, is uh, Ted, you mentioned that through automation, you expect that people will not um, be able to, they won't have, because they've been put out of a job, they won't be able to purchase goods and services uh, produced by that automation. Do I have that? Did I understand that correctly? And and that your concern for that is, if you could repeat it for for us. So it's not. I I don't uphold Keynes's um, definition of technological unemployment. I'm not saying that automation automatically puts people out of work. I'm saying that the more automated capitalism gets, the deeper the crisis of capitalism becomes. And as a result, so I'm talking about about what I what I termed economic unemployment. The reason that unemployment is going up is because it's becoming unprofitable to to employ this pe these people because what you get is a, you get surplus capital arises right out of the crisis. So um, the more automated the system gets, the more the rate of profit falls. And therefore, the, the more cap, the harder it is to generate to yield a profit. So a certain amount of capital becomes surplus. It, it goes unused. The companies go bust. Um, land goes underutilized. Um, milk gets destroyed. Other foods and, and goods get destroyed because it's not profitable to, to produce them anymore. Um, okay. So, Why? Why is it no longer profitable to produce them anymore? What is the thing that no longer makes them profitable exactly in your view? The, the rate of profit is falling. So, so the, the number of people employed compared to the total amount of capital in the system, uh, the, the ratio is, is growing all the time in favor of capital. So if human labor is is the element that produces value you've got to squeeze more and more surplus value out of that element to reproduce and expand the the other element because capitalism i'm sure we're all agreed is about capital accumulation it has to keep accumulating so because of this contradiction it goes into crisis alongside surplus value grows surplus um, labor 
So it's no longer profitable for these companies to employ the labor they were that they were employing before because they their their profit margins are so thin that to avoid going bust they need to cut back on expenditure uh, to try and to try and improve their profit margins so that means cutting okay. wages innovating yep. in ways that will save money um, uh, in the long term to keep to 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 keep them viable uh, okay, Sam, so, you try to keep this response to four minutes. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, so let me uh, respond by saying that what I just described, explanation for the savings to investment gap that Ted and I both agree exists and is drastic. That is the hoarding of cash by firms in the private sector, lack of investment made by those firms. That was... Uh, what, Ted gave us an explanation for that reality, for that existence. Nobody disputes this. It's not controversial. It's entirely empirical. We all agree. Every, every economist, every proponent of any economic school data is right there. So uh, I don't disagree with the savings to investment gap uh, realities. What I do disagree with is his explanation for it. So the explanation that I offer for it is that this is due to a lack of demand. It's not that automation in and of itself is going to put people out, uh, is in and of itself going to reduce profits. Now, the only way that would happen is if people as a result of being laid off no longer had dollars necessary to purchase the goods and services that the robots are producing. That is that is the crux of it. If you, if, if and I, and I, we can talk about this when we get to the, the futurism as, uh, uh, part of the debate, but uh, yes, it's true that if uh, automation were to put everybody out of work and nobody had any other source of of, um, of income, uh, or didn't receive any other form of transfer payments in one shape, way, or, or another, this is where like ideas like universal basic income come in, etc. Uh, then yes, nobody would have the money necessary to produce anything that the robots produce. Private sector firms would stop producing because nobody's buying. There's no demand. Just laid off customers they just laid off all of their customers installed automation and you know there goes your economy uh, into deep crisis and recession so my explanation for that and, and i think it's the rational explanation is due to a lack of demand um, that could only happen in the scenario that ted describes if there was a lack of demand um can i give uh, can i bounce it back to ted for like a minute or two because i want to do more quick things on mmt before we go into um the chapters of his book or we uh, use that as a roadmap well, we kind of sorry we kind of are talking about uh the, the first two sections here anyway okay. the rate of profit and and, and uh automation okay, so we can just keep going on this great right. let's do that okay so again if there's a lack of demand then that that is a problem obviously but you you skipped over there the thing that comes before that which is that people were made unemployed, they therefore get poorer, and therefore the demand is still there because these people still want to eat, but they can't afford to anymore because they don't have the money. Ah, okay, they're, well. They're having to, they're having, having to, so you've got to explain why they become unemployed. And the reason for that is, is because unemployment rises alongside uh, the rise of surplus capital because that capital isn't profitable to invest. The, these um, these offshore accounts are not; they don't exist purely for greed, for reasons of greed. Like obviously, that's part of it. But they would love to invest this capital because why not? Why why wouldn't they want to expand it? Um, especially if the demand is there. But the demand is going to fall technically if people have less money. And and the reason that that right. happens is because of surplus capital, you know, it's unprofitable to invest it, and then you get the unemployment, and then the demand falls. Um, again, so all money comes from the state. It can't come from anywhere else. Microsoft doesn't have a printing press. Amazon doesn't have a printing press. Um, for your, you know, astute audience members, they might ask, but what about banks? 
What about banks when they make loans? And this is an excellent question. And for anyone who's been paying attention, I hope you uh, have run that across your mind because it is the right question to be asking. What happens with banks? Do commercial banks, you know, the bank that you have a checking account in, they create money. Do they change the net supply of money in the private sector? The net money supply only changes when there is a transfer between government and non-government sectors. There is the government sector, which is the public, so to in quotes, right? Or at least it's supposed to represent the public. There is the private sector, and then there's the foreign sector. The foreign sector and the private sector constitute the non-government sector. The Treasury, the central bank, the Congress, that constitutes the public sector. Okay? So we have to keep this in mind because when a bank creates money, it's not changing the net money supply. How does it create money? It's not creating money from people's deposits. This is the thing that everybody assumes. If I make a deposit at a bank, and that uses that <clears throat> uses that, that deposit to then loan that money out to somebody else at a rate of return, they make a profit. No. Okay. Deposits do not, <clears throat> excuse me, deposits do not create loans. Loans create deposits. When you take out a loan at a bank, one account is being debited, another account is being credited. The account in which that loan is being deposited is credited. The bank on its balance sheet has a negative number. Okay, so where did the money come from? Where did the bank get the money? The thing that everybody hears is, oh, it's the money multiplier effect. As a result of fractional reserve banking, another myth. It's a nice theory. It's a really nice model. It makes logical sense. Unfortunately, it's not in the least bit real. What really happens is that that bank, that commercial bank that you got that loan, it keystrokes that money into existence, but it doesn't change the net money supply in the private sector. Why? And this is critical. The reason it doesn't is because you have to pay that loan back. You have to pay that loan back. So what is my asset? When I, when I take a loan, when I get a loan from a bank, what's my asset? My asset is the loan. What's my liability? My liability is the promissory note that says I have to pay the loan back. What is the bank's asset when it issued me the loan? The bank's asset is the promissory note. Okay? The bank's liability is the loan that they gave me. Why is the promissory note the asset? Because it promises that I will pay with interest. Right? These are accounting identities, Ted. And this is really, I think, the part of your, like, if this were a part of the analysis in your book, I think it would change a lot of your criticisms and a lot of your causes for concern and what direction that they're coming from. Okay, so now I have to go out into the private economy. I have to get the money that I just loaned from you, my bank, to pay you back. What is the private economy? It's a net zero. It's net zero. You gave me money. I have to go get it and give it back to you. What is what is the what is the result? Zero. Net zero. There can be by a point of logic and a point of accounting identity. And what's interesting, I should point out as a quick aside, is every time I explain MMT to a CPA, they get it instantly. They're like, oh yeah, that's just double entry accounting. Oh yeah, yeah, you're saying that the, the government is uh, has a monopoly on money. It's like, yes, that's what we're saying. The, the government, a monetarily sovereign government, that's key, that's to be precise, a monetarily sovereign government, as I described what the criteria were, okay, has a monopoly on money. Let me send it back to Ted, but I think we can keep going because we're covering a lot of what's in his book here. I'm not. I'm not disputing that the the um, the central bank as a sovereign issuer um, isn't. I'm not saying that they're they're not the issuers of money at all. I. I, I that's that's not in question. Um, yeah, I agree. Debts, debts have to be repaid, but what happens if you can't repay it? Because ah, yes, because your business has gone out of 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 uh, uh, it's become unprofitable and has gone bust. That's right. So yeah. you have to explain that. Um, that's that's the thing. Um, I just want to come back on something. Like I just want to point out that, and this is in the book that the rate of profit doesn't just sort of tend to fall in cycles it's falling historically towards zero. So there, it's, there's 
a good few studies showing this that it's it's a lot lower now than it was 150 years ago obviously it goes up and down you know zigzags up and down but the secular trend is towards zero so again this has to be explained and the only theory that really explains this is marx's labor theory of value and the fact that that labor is is diminishing um is playing a diminishing role in, in the production process so um yeah so and for that reason companies go bust and then they can't repay their loan so and then and then the tax base shrinks and they have to issue more money as a result they have to issue more debt as a result to make up for the lack of we profit just, we just covered it, this being made uh, yeah but this is the central issue right. and then eventually so, you're going to get hyperinflation eventually you're going to get hyperinflation it's unsustainable every everything everything that you uh, okay and we, we got to go through your book at some point because i i have to do a, a treatment i have a criticism of what you consider to be uh, inflationary forces that are in fact uh, in fact hyper inflationary forces as you just mentioned that i would uh, argue are empir are empirically deflationary forces but before we do that steve can i just like real quick because he met, brought up taxes again and i didn't get a chance to explain what the function of taxes are if not to finance government spending we go into the criticism it'll be a good groundwork for that i think sure I'll keep it brief thank you so, all right, if taxes, as I claim, as and as MMT claims, um, don't finance government spending, right, then what are taxes for, right? That it begs the question, like, okay, what is the point of taxes then, right? So a few things. First and foremost, to mitigate, okay, when you pay your taxes, literally what happens is your money is deleted from the economy. If you were to bring taxes to the IRS. I don't know if you can still do this in the UK, but in the United States legally, you can. You can bring your taxes to the IRS, and pay them in cash. What the IRS used to do is just straight burn the money. Now what they do is I think they shred it. I don't know if they still burn it, but they at least shred it, if not shred it and burn it. Why, why would they do that? Well, because they don't need your money. The government doesn't need your money to finance spending. So why does it tax? It taxes to mitigate against inflation. We have an abundance of historical evidence for this. Take Great Depression, World War II era, all right? We had war bonds. Franklin Roosevelt issued war bonds into the economy. Why did he do it? Okay. What he told people was, and he used a patriotic, an appeal to their patriotism and said, look, we need to finance the war. Buy these war bonds. It's going to pay for the war. The real function, and everybody inside, and his economic administration understood this, the real function of the war bonds was to take, remove purchasing power, diminish pur purchasing power sector, okay, as a way to mitigate inflation in the system. Now, why were they so concerned with inflation? Because they were spending so much. The federal government moved 50% of GDP from private consumption to public consumption, which means if the private sector continues to spend at the same level as, as, as public expenditures increase by that much, when you're moving that much of GDP from the private sector to the public sector, you're going to have the type of hyperinflation that Ted is so concerned with, but that cannot possibly exist in the type of economy that we live in today, both pre-COVID since the financial crisis and post-COVID. Every single indicator is that we're, if anything, approaching deflationary periods. Even the Federal Reserve Board of the United States uh, is doing everything they can, trying to use monetary policy to create and generate a little inflation in the system. And it's not working because monetary policy is anemic. It does not actually change the money supply. Ted mentioned quantitative easing. I'm not going to go into that right now. We'll get to it later. But other reasons for taxes. Okay, second thing is social engineering purposes. Taxes are not redistributive. When you tax Jeff Bezos, you can't tax Jeff Bezos and give it to somebody else. What you can do is tax Jeff Bezos for whatever political reasons you may want to tax Jeff Bezos okay, to narrow the gap between rich and poor. You can do it for that reason. You can narrow the wealth inequality gap through taxation. 
cannot redistribute. You cannot redistribute. It's literally impossible under a modern monetary system to redistribute wealth through taxation. Okay? The third reason, and I mentioned this early when we got started, is the provision itself. Okay? Because it has, the government has to create a demand for the currency. And the only way to do that is to say, look, I need you, Ted, to dig a ditch. You say to me, damn, go screw yourself. Why should I? I say, well, because uh, if you don't, if you don't dig that ditch, you won't have the money you need to pay the tax I've levied on you. Now, what have I done? Functionally, what have I just done? I've just made you unemployed. I've just made you unemployed. Functionally speaking, the government can purchase as much labor as it wants for whatever purpose it wants. It can invest in as many goods and services as it wants, in as much production as it wants, up until the point of runaway inflation, which we haven't addressed the inflation question yet, but I'm sure it'll come up as we continue. Uh, okay, Ted, why don't you um, respond here and then uh, we'll move on after that. Okay, so we have to ask the question, if this is all true, why do we see so many sort of changes in, in the direction of the economy or why have we in the past, you know, um, why was there a war? <laughs> why was the, well, why was there a depression? There has, these can't just be put down to sort of mistakes in policy because they keep happening. Um, you know, there would have, we would have learned from them otherwise. Um, so the reason public spending took off uh, and sort of replaced private, um, private generation of, of wealth was because um, the private, comp private sector had gone bust. So you have to explain why the private, obviously it hadn't gone totally bust, but a lot of it had, had, had broken down. That's why there was a, that was the fundamental reason behind the Wall Street crash. Um, um, and my, expl my theoretical ex explanation explains that. Um, in terms of we're, se we're seeing deflation, and you, and you said it yourself, they're concerned with deflation, so they're trying to generate a bit of inflation. Right. That's, that's, that's absolutely what's happening. That's what I'm saying. They're trying to stop deflation. They're trying to stop a, a deflationary crisis. And the only way to do that is to, to inflate. So they're, they're, they're inflating, they're trying to reinflate pension funds because if they collapse, You've got a massive social issue on your hands and, and so on and so forth. So they're, they're always fighting these, um, these crises that are generated by capitalism itself. And um, that's why eventually, I'm not saying like, I'm not saying like there should have been hyperinflation by now or something like that. I'm saying that eventually this becomes completely unsustainable and eventually because they're trying to offset a sort of hyper deflation, it will spur, it will spur a, a, a hyperinflation. Obviously they could choose not to hyperinflate, but you would just get hyper deflation at, at some point and that would cause its own massive social crisis. Okay, Sam, unless you have anything new to add in critique of his book here, I would like to move on to, uh, for time-wise here, the the future of, uh, of socialism, you know, dictatorship of the, of the proletariat and uh, versus anarchism here, unless you have anything in particular you wanted to really get in. Um, yeah, just a couple minutes on, on a few things. Uh, one, we haven't actually addressed what causes inflation what are the inflationary pressures i can do that for folks um very very quickly actually um i said that the only constraint to government spending is inflation okay well what causes inflation the answer is resource constraints well what are resource constraints sam what are you talking about put this in layman's terms all right so here's what it is there are two types of inflation okay 
There's demand pull and cost push inflation. Demand pull inflation is this. When aggregate demand exceeds real productive output. Okay? In other words, when there is, and there is no slack in the economy in terms of resources. So what does this mean? Let me put this all in layman's terms. If you have three factors of production, land, labor, and capital. By the way, this is like Econ 101 across the board. This isn't some like MMT thing. This is just Econ 101, but land, labor, and capital. And when, you, when we say capital in the factors of production sense, we are talking about machinery. So don't think like capital is in like money. That's not the way that capital is being used in this sense when talking about the factors of production, okay? So you have a certain amount of utilization, a certain capacity. Let's take labor, because that's an easy one to explain, right? You have a certain number of people, adults in the population, who can work. That is your current capacity, right? The degree to which they're being utilized, the difference between the capacity and the degree to be what they're being utilized is slack. So what do we what is slack in labor resource? It's unemployment. Okay. So let's say you have 100 units of labor available, you use 90 units. Guess what? You have a 10% unemployment rate. Let's say you have you use 99 units of 100, you have a 1% unemployment rate, right? You've got that one person who's not working, right? So when demand exceeds, all right, when demand exceeds production, that's when you have inflationary pressure demand exceeds production and you have no slack in the economy because one of the things you can do let's say you have demand a lot of demand it exceeds current production well no problem increase productivity and you can do that as long as you have slack as long as you have room between where you're at and the cap of land labor and capital do that so you've got aggregate demand okay aggregate demand goes up all right and your employment utilization is 95 percent okay but demand has gone up no problem all right, you hire more people, problem solved. But what happens when you hit the cap, when you can't hire any more people, all right? That's when you get inflationary pressure, all right? So what do you do? What are some of your options? Well, you can increase capacity, right? This is like water in a tub, all right? Well, increase capacity. How do you increase labor capacity? Immigration is one way, all right? You increase the size of the labor force. How do you increase capacity for machinery? Make faster, smarter, better machines. How do you increase capacity for land? You change zoning laws. That's a way to do it, right? So that land that is idle, some, some productive purpose can be repurposed for that productive purpose. Right? So that's demand pull, all right? Well, the way that people tend to think about this is uh, too much money chasing too few goods and services. It's a little bit more, it's a lot more sophisticated than that, but that's one basic way of thinking about it. All right. The other type of a major form of inflation is what's called, what's called cost, cost push inflation. So you have an increase in prices due to a severe shortage or reduction of a certain essential commodity, typically an essential commodity like oil. This is what happened in the 1970s with OPEC. OPEC, for political reasons, cut production. OK. And we had a huge spike in inflation in the United States. All of a sudden, everything that that relied on oil to be produced became more expensive to produce. So of course you're going to get inflationary pressure. So those are the two main forms of, so those are the two main forms of, the, of inflationary pressure, uh, types of inflation, how that pressures for the, each of them derive. Just very quickly, um, we've got to remember that Capitalism is based on commodity production, right? So you can, you can produce all your commodities. If you don't sell them, you don't realize your profit and the labor that went into them goes to waste and the value isn't realized. So this is part of the problem of a system based on the private means of production and on commodity production. Um, and the other thing I wanted to say was um, that we have to explain why uh, interest rates, baseline interest rates are now at zero, whereas before the um, 2007 yes, crisis, 
they were higher. They were at 6% or whatever. And before that, they were a bit higher still. And it usually takes a 4 to 5% cut in the baseline interest rate yeah. to get an economy going again, to get the... Yeah to get the flow of capital circulating again so that banks are lending and all the rest of it. We're now at zero and they've only been cut so far during this crisis by about 2%. So they're going to, I mean, they don't want, they've, they've said they don't want to go negative and even the proponents of negative rates say that in the end they tend to do more harm than good. Yeah, so, this, is, this is great. No, I'm glad, I'm glad Ted brought this up. Can, can we keep riffing on this, Stephen? uh if you if you're if you're short yeah okay uh how many minutes give me a time limit okay, and I'll do, stick. Give, give, do, let's do three minutes here. oh okay you're gonna give me three right, i'll take three <laughs> I, was, I was offering two but i'll take three okay so um zero percent interest rates and ted's concern he says look obviously there's a problem here it hasn't spurred investment um hasn't gotten us out of crisis, that hasn't created demand. I mean, at least he's suggesting these things. It hasn't created new production. That's right. That's exactly what MMT says, which is that monetary policy is anemic. It does not change the supply of money in the economy. It, it can't. It can't. Like, okay, you said 0% interest rates. Well, if I don't have any way of paying back a loan, what difference does it make if you said interest rates is 0%? And even if I am one of those people in a crisis who can't afford a loan, or can afford credit, and you set a zero interest rate, it doesn't change the net money supply of the private sector. Because I then still have to go back out into the private sector and get that money in order to be able to pay back my creditor. Okay? The only thing works, the only game in town in the regard that Ted is talking about is fiscal policy. That's the only game in town. And I'm happy to provide, you know, after I, at some point later, what my own criticisms of MMT are. Um, but yeah, the only game in town is the power of the fiscal authority, the power of the purse, which lies with Congress to spend money into existence. It has to cross the barrier between sectors. The money has to flow from one sector to another before there's a change in the net money supply. The government has to spend the money into the private sector in order for there to be a net change in the money supply. Uh, okay, let me just interject real quick. I mean, uh, but Sam, what, what good is, you know, tweaking the money supply if as ted says the rate of profit is 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 heading towards a a a, a zero point um, in the next 20 30 years and constant capital is is at a point where things aren't profitable anymore and there's nowhere to put all this money that, that i mean that the mmt can drum up yeah we we, we we're, we're we're beating a dead horse here but i don't mind because i want to drive the point home the reason for that is a lack of demand. So how do you generate demand? Okay. Well, look, there's there's a couple of different ways to do this. There's a couple of, when you have an anemic economy, the public sector can spend money into existence, or it can cut taxes, or it can do some combination of the two. Okay. You can and one there's a counter cyclical option here, and it's actually the only thing that comes close to an inherent policy prescription in MMT. MMTers have all, you know, sorts of different policy prescriptions for uh, how to leverage what MMT describes as the operational realities of the monetary system. Okay? But in terms of an inherent policy prescription, the federal jobs guarantee. We already have countercyclical measures in every government. When the economy goes into recession, you know what happens in all of the countries I mentioned and, and also in many others that aren't mon fully monetarily sovereign? Things like the extension of unemployment benefits. This doesn't go and debate on this and then say, okay, yeah, we're gonna do it. No, when the unemployment rate hits a certain number, certain benefits automatically kick in. You can do the same thing with the federal, the federal jobs guarantee functionally operates the same way. It's counter cyclical. If you can make it, a, it's, it's an automatic stabilizer. So what do I mean? When you're in a business cycle down tick, the government will hire more people at a guaranteed rate for a guaranteed job that's socially useful in the community. Okay? And so that expands the federal job guarantee pool. It expands the number of employed in the federal job guarantee. Now, when you have a business cycle uptick, guess what? It's going 
to shrink. How is it going to shrink? It's not because the government says, well, you know, the, the private sector is doing great, so we're going to fire you. No, it's because the private sector is going to need those again. It's when you have a business cycle uptick, I mean, this is not controversial, business cycle goes up, employment up, down, perfect. Well, where are they going to get the workers? Well, if you have a buffer stock ready to go, people who haven't had their skills diminish, have been keeping up with skills, learning new skills, doing socially useful work in the community, the private sector or even the public sector can hire those people. It's a transitional job program but what that everyone is entitled to. You have a right to work what good are Go skills ahead. though if, if if every everyone's getting proletarianized and in, in automation I'll, I'll i'll let ted uh, finish off here i i, I think i think we've I've, I've i've covered what i want to say i think we should move on now okay yeah let's <laughs> let's do that okay and our final section is oops hold on where to go our final section is uh, the future of socialism uh oh wait um yeah dictatorship of the proletariat um yeah let's just start with you ted and why you think uh socialism has got to be you know done through the dictatorship of the proletariat instead can of we the can we yeah can we do a coin flip here and and just whoever wins gets to decide if they want to go first or second here and then whoever you know gets the opposite for the last section of closing you, statements you want to go first no, I, I'm, I'm saying I would like to, to do this fair. I, mean, I thought we were, okay, fine. we're socialists. Let's flip a coin. All right, all right, all right. All right. All right. Who's got heads? Ted, you have heads. Okay. Uh, we have a uh, Canadian nickel, and it is tails. Sam, okay. you can go. Okay. I'm going to I'm gonna let, I'm going to, no, I'm going to let, uh, I'll go first because I would like to go last on the closing statement. Okay. So I'll, I'll go first on the Marxism versus Anna. I'll go first here on the Marxism versus anarchism's vision for moving past sure. capitalism. Because we didn't tie any of this into our sort of ideological leanings, right? So it's important that we do that. So, um, six minutes. My anarchist vision and what I think is wrong with uh, Ted's Marxist vision, all right? I believe that we can MMT our way out of capitalism. That MMT creates new imaginative horizons and possibilities for creating a future in which the state can wither away. There are a number of practical ways in which this can come about. Now, people will ask me, well, Sam, if you're saying that the government needs to spend more money, the national debt's not big enough, budget deficits are not big enough, doesn't that make, make people more dependent on the state? The thing is this, when you give people resources and freedom, they have more options available to them. They have more time. They have more time to challenge the way they live, to overcome structures of hierarchy and coercion. And also, you're not making them, when public expenditures actually benefit the people, it weakens the state's position. It has less authority over people because people are more independent, they're more autonomous. They're more able to fend for themselves and become fully independent in ways that will allow them to form a vision, direct democracy that I would point to models historically throughout the world as good antecedents or precedents, excuse me. Currently, one such model is Rojava, Northwest Syria. See that as a model for a future global society society, the principles on which it's founded, something that we should be driving toward. Okay. So I'm concerned with the here and now. I'm concerned with what's immediate, what can be accomplished as quickly as possible. I want to end as much suffering that exists as fast as possible. The M what MMT describes as the monetary and fiscal operations is the only game in town right now that I see. So what is wrong, in my view, with Ted's Marxist vision? One, he requires a dictatorship of the proletariat. Okay? I think all, uh, all unjustified authority, all authority that cannot legitimize itself in those over who they're lording it over is coercive and illegitimate. Okay. State power is corrupt inherently, and it's inherently corrupting. 
all right? The, the notion that an enlightened cobble of vanguard Marxists are going to seize state power and be benevolent with it, that is not borne out by history, certainly not borne out in the relationship between Marxists and anarchists over hundreds of years. Um, and it's certainly not borne out by the relationship between those Marxists seizing power and the constituency for whom they promised liberation. So what I propose is a system of direct democracy. Paris Commune is another example. Revolutionary Catalonia is another example. Madagascar is another example in the late 1980s, early 1990s. We have a number of examples that actually functioned and been liberatory, unlike what we've seen with Marxist examples where two forms of oppression have been reconstituted that were often worse than those that they overthrew. Politically, that's what I find wrong with Ted's vision. I also think that his economics, as I think I've demonstrated throughout this, all of his concerns for why capitalism is about to implode are exactly backwards. Capitalism will go into crisis and continue to go in crisis for exactly the opposite reasons that Ted posits in his book. And I encourage people to read it because there is a lot that I agree with. In fact, politically, I would say I agree with half of what Ted is with. In terms of innovation and utilization of key resources, that aren't being utilized, that aren't being used for innovation, such as hemp, that Ted gives an excellent treatment. We didn't talk about a Green New Deal. There, I think that Ted has more than legitimate concerns. There are very real concerns about resource extraction in order to develop types of infrastructure required to get to a carbon net zero economy. I think that the Green New Deal and its policy advocates, people like Fadel Kaboob, K-A-B-O-U-B, for those who are interested, who's an mmt or that works on Green New Deal issues, um, have a plan, have a roadmap in which they take Ted's concerns into account. So we're not at total discord here. Okay? The other thing that we're not in total discord about, and I want to, one minute, one minute, is that MMT does, is not inherently opposed in any way to the notion that value is sourced in production. We're not at odds with that. And there's nothing in MMT that says that's not it. That's not our focus, but we, we don't oppose that idea. No, MMT doesn't. There may be certain MMTers who disagree, but I, I think that's sort of self-evident in a lot of ways. Um, for goods and services to have value realized, they have to be purchased. In order to be purchased, there has to be... Uh, yeah, we don't have any issue with that. Like, there's nothing in MMT that contradicts that, Ted. Uh, but in order and in order to be purchased, there has to be demand. I mean, we have to keep that in mind. In order for a good or service to be purchased, there has to be demand. There has to be demand. Again, there has to be a demand. Um, so the fundamentals of Marxism are not in any way inherently contradictory to MMT. You know. Okay, Ted, uh, let's get your your response. I'll give you the same amount of time here. Okay, so you started this debate by saying that MMT is not a political project, but you've just said that you think we can MMT our way out of capitalism. So that does sound like a political project to me. No, it's, it's not inherently a political project at all, Ted. What did I just say? I said, I am graft, as I said at the beginning, you can graft on to it any type of political orientation that you want. Let me say one quick thing, and I don't mean to interrupt, but very quickly, you know who the two presidents, I was born in 1982, the two presidents who have most leveraged what MMT describes as the operational and functional realities of a monetary sovereign in my lifetime are Ronald Reagan and Donald Trump, unfortunately. Unfortunately. What did they do with MMT? Ronald Reagan cut taxes and increased, and increased military spend. Right? What did Donald Trump do in terms of leveraging what MMT he describes the reality. He cut taxes on who? The rich. Those are political choices. They're not economic yeah. necessities. And we haven't even gotten into austerity yet, but I'm sorry to interrupt. But by, co by coincidence, those two presidents have come to power during the deepest economic crises in the post-world, uh, post-war era. So, and this comes on to the point about the dictatorship of the proletariat. The deeper the, the crisis gets, the more right wing the, the governments seem to get because 
they need to attack the working class more. They need to cut wages more, uh, and so on and so forth. No, 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 they don't. <laughs> well, that's my. I'm arguing they that don't they don't need to cut wages more. Okay. Well, of course. Why are they doing it then? <laughs> private, <laughs> private. Just, the private. You're about private sector, firms. The private sector needs to cut jobs oh, and wages. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Which is what they're doing. In, in, yeah. If, if, in the face if, of in the face of a lack of public expenditure. In the face of a lack of public expenditure, you're absolutely right. Then only are they going to cut wages, they're going to lay people Sam, off. Sam, Sam, let him finish. Public expenditures at an all-time high because of this. Yes, there needs to be more. But as you said, inflation is a constraint. So that is a problem. Yeah. Um, Show me the inflation in the system. Well, the, the fiat, currencies, so fiat currencies are devalued by nearly 100% over the last yeah, century. That's, that's, yeah, exactly. Because when you don't distinguish between stock and flow variables and you look over the entire accumulated history of a currency, you can say that. But so what? Can you, you not? The question is, can you or can you not afford a Snickers bar? Are you willing to spend what a Snickers bar costs yes, so or not? Are. Exactly. 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 So I'm all for redistributive efforts. I'm all for changing dollar distribution problems. The idea that we're going to, the only way to get there right now to do this tomorrow so that people stop suffering is through a glorious, you know, revolutionary vanguard dictatorship of the proletariat. We haven't even talked about the weakness of, of trade unions in the United right, States Sam, Sam, and Great Britain. They're at their weakest point they've ever been. Uh, well, Marx, Marxism has a critique of trade unions as, as usually representing a privileged layer of the working class. But anyway, um, as I was saying, the, the governments are getting more and more right wing, right? And this is this is a problem for everyone who isn't a supporter of these governments and many of their supporters, as they will they will end up finding out um, because they're going to get poorer. Um, you so if if you're saying that you could M M T your way out of capitalism into socialism, that is going to need some authority and authority is going to be in charge of that process and it's also going to need to defend itself from uh right wingers and counter revolutionaries who want to stop that process so it's going to have to use some sort of force and coercion to stop that counter revolutionary process and that's part of what the dictatorship of the proletariat is it's the recognition that the majority of the population um, is um, proletarian and therefore the most democratic system is a proletarian democracy and a, 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 all, a, all, of, all dictatorship, the word dictatorship means is rule, that's all it means, we, we live under a dictatorship of capital, a dictatorship of the bourgeoisie, that's the rule of capital, the rule of bourgeoisie, so a proletarian dictatorship would be the rule of the proletarians the majority of society. So it's already automatically more democratic than what we had before. The state under socialism is the people. Is is uh, that's that's basically what it comes down to that it's 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 no longer a state imposed on the people. It's the state becomes subordinate to the people and the central organs of the state are a manifestation of 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 um, what the people decide to do from below. So there's no there's no. Um, I, I mean, obviously there were periods during socialism where it became more centralised in the past, but that was because it became it was under constant siege from from the imperialist nations like after the russian revolution you had 30 it was invaded by 13 um other countries so it had to it had to have a centralized of, of you know a more centralized system than it wanted it also I, and i have to defend the soviet union here on on several bases it was so first it was isolated and under attack throughout its history whether that was economically or militarily, um, it therefore had to defend. It had therefore had to spend far more on its um, on its defence spending than it wanted to, to the detriment of the civilian economy. Um, it it had to trade with capitalist countries 
um, where it could have, where it could um, sort of um, circumvent sanctions, which meant it couldn't fully fully plan its economy um, because it couldn't predict for the prices of foreign currency. It was also, as a result, logical to build up to to allow some sort of black market because that was a way of bringing foreign currency into the country. And these things, these problems, did distort the functioning. Um, of the country. You also got to remember that this was a country that had never really exper experienced any sort of democracy before. And I do think that that contributed to a, the sort of bureaucratic form that it took. Um, you've also got a country with, a widespread, with wise, widespread illiteracy, so that widespread illiteracy, never experienced democracy before. Um, under siege, can't fully plan its economy needs to build up foreign currency in the end became too dependent on foreign currency um so we we do need to abstract to a to a point of would these same problems reoccur under world socialism the answer is is no because under world socialism there would be no comp there would, the competition between over profit and result and um assets would no longer exist between nation states 30 seconds Okay. We then need to add, we then need to come back to the reality and say, well, well, can the whole world become socialist at the same time? Probably not. It's probably going to be one, you know, probably by definition there has to be socialism in one country first, and then hopefully there will be more and more. But until socialist countries aren't isolated, they need to be able to defend themselves from external sources who are also funding, you know, internal um, counter revolutionaries. So. You need you need uh, a proletarian state that can defend itself. I'm I'm sorry, Ted, but I don't buy the notion that those that seize state power will then abdicate it and salute it back can to I the people. Can I address that then? Yes. What the 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 idea that um, this never happened in all of human history, but this time you guys are going to get it right. Well, I, I, I did address this in the book. I, did, I didn't just sort of assume that it was going to get it right. We're near, what I'm saying is capitalism is nearing the end of its, of its natural lifespan. It will not be able to go on much longer, right? So I think we are heading in the direction of a world revolution. Um, and when that point comes, the problems that we saw, some of the problems that we saw with the Soviet Union won't be of such concern anymore. I'm not saying that individuals are going to become like uh, totally uncorruptible or anything like that. That's another reason for having a uh, for having a state um, to mediate things between different sections of the working class. To mediate things between a communist international would be needed to mediate relations between different nation states. But we are, right. you know, capitalism is. Without crisis, capitalism was heading in a direction of abundance of abundance for all. And it's like like you said, the more resources we are, we have, the freer we are. I absolutely agree with that. But it's it's uh, it's socialism is going to be needed because that that process has been interrupted by by capitalism coming up against historical limits. And to complete that process of achieving like abundance for all, if you like is going to take a socialist mode of production um, and and the socialist mode of production will therefore be able to carry on and complete the process of achieving fully, fully automated production uh, you know and then when and then when you get to that point the state will wither away because it will become increasingly irrelevant i'd like a chance to talk a little bit more about my vision now that uh, ted has fleshed his out yep sure. segments here so skip five minutes. Great, thank you. So I want what Ted wants in terms of running a communist society. I think, I think there's a step though that Marxists take that is completely unnecessary. That that is the capturing of state power. The transitory state, the transitional state to communism, I find to be an abomination. I it to be an abomination because I'm convinced that it will simply lead back to many of the systems of hierarchy and oppression that existed in the state that came before it. Now, I'm not saying that 
all projects evolve over time and attempt to be implemented. Don't go through a series of being rejected, not working, not getting accepted. As a matter of fact, in the case of capitalism, the early history of capitalism, there was failure after failure after failure after failure of, uh, after failure of getting it to work before it finally succeeded in becoming the dominant functioning modus operandi of, of our, our collective civilizations. Now, that is an argument for Ted's case, which is that, well, you know, we sure we had some things that didn't work for various reasons, but we, you know, we learned from them, we failed, we're gonna potentially fail better next time or succeed. Maybe, maybe, it's, it's possible, but I have doubts. I have doubts, not because of any views or notions I have in nature, not to open up a can of worms, but you know, as an anarchist, I believe that human beings have an inherent sense of justice. They are inherently, quote unquote, good. I can put it in terms. But that's not what I'm worried about. What I'm worried about is the corrupting influence of the state itself. That the state itself drives out a sense of justice that I believe is endowed in every human. That the state ultimately, unless checked and pressured constantly to do otherwise, is going to serve those that give it power. In our current situation, who is that? What is that? It's corporate America, clearly. Oligarchs, clearly. I don't think we have any disagreement about it. I'm sure where we have lots of disagreement is on coercion and hierarchy in and of itself. I'm sure that Ted sees outgrowths of social and racial injustice. I'm sure Ted sees social and racial injustice and other forms of oppression as outgrowths of capitalism. I see them as outgrowths of hierarchy. I see capitalism as an outgrowth of hierarchy and domination, along with all of these other areas in which we find injustice. So to me, it's not class in and of itself. Class in and of itself and class struggle is not the problem. It is a problem. That's not the root cause for me, isn't it? So I'm sure that fundamentally, Ted and I disagree there. As far as just my vision for another minute or two goes, I think that what we have before us is a real choice. One, on the one hand, and I'm invoking Yanis Varoufakis here, who has cites multiple times in his book and also writes about critically in his book, that I think that we have two choices before us. One is a matrix-like future. The other is a Star Trek future. I'd like to see us head toward the Star Trek future. I think that we can spur innovation and technology in a way that makes working for a living I distinguish from working, obsolete and unnecessary. I think the time has come to really consider ways for us to head down that path in a way that's going to end as much suffering as possible immediately, provide peer, people with the material goods and services they need to run their lives in a dignified way, and also allow human creativity to flourish. I am convinced that you can go to any grocery store in America. And there is someone languishing away who otherwise could have been the next Chopin if only it wasn't for opportunity, if only if it wasn't for having what they need in terms of resources to realize their full potential. I don't think anyone should have to do, be coerced to do any kind of work. White collar, blue collar, it doesn't matter. There are those people who love very much what they do, and they're the lucky ones. They're the lucky ones. Find incredible satisfaction and self aggrandizement in what they spend eight hours a day, every day doing. But that is not the reality, as Ted knows, the majority of people. And we can change the system in such a way, using the tools that are on the shelf, MMT being one of them, to reach a better future, the kind that I'm sure Ted and I would much prefer to live in, and that we both think would be much more dignified. Okay, so um, your view was that, um, did you say it's sort of capitalism comes, grows out of hierarchy, is that what you said? Oh, I said that Rather than the, other the injustices way. that we see, the injustices that we see 
don't stem from capitalism, okay, in and of itself. They don't exist because capitalism, it starts with capitalism, okay? Capital, it starts with hierarchy. And capitalism is, without a doubt, as you agree, a form of hierarchy. Okay. So I, I would argue that hierarchy flows from the capitalist mode of production because you've got a division of, you've got a division in society, capitalists own the capital and workers have to work for them. They have to work for a living. Um, that's obviously a, an immediate form of hi hierarchy. Can I ask uh, a question? Can I ask a quick question to you then? Is, is that not a, you know, you would agree that that's a coercive form of hierarchy, right? You just said it, coercive yeah. form of hierarchy. Okay. Yeah. There, are other, there are other coercive forms of hierarchy that, ex that would exist even without capitalism. Capitalism yeah, may not, amplify not them, they may don't. augment them. Sorry, say again? I'm, I'm not saying that that's not the case. I'm just okay. saying that that is the case under, under capitalism. That's, that's the, primary, the primary reason for hierarchy in this, in this system. And we're dealing with this system. Um, again, the state, a socialist state should be, should be the people. Like the whole, the state should be the population un, under, under socialism. Because there's no longer a private sector, and there's the the state is no longer um, uh, representing the, the 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 capitalists. Um, so, and um, we're getting uh, we're getting into like actual socialism now. I mean, look, there is an argument that, for example, Cuba is still building socialism because it's. It's had to make concessions to capital. Um, it's the, there's a there's a there's a reasonable argument to be made that it's building socialism rather than being cap being socialist per se, according to a very rigid definition. Um, and like all the other socialist states, it's faced isolation and therefore has had to make certain concessions uh, because it has to trade with the rest of the world and, and therefore needs foreign currency. But there, there is another reason I think that uh, you need a socialist state before you get. So a socialist state would be the lower form, of, the lower stage of communism before you get to the to the higher stage where the state withers away. So capitalism is becoming more and more, more and more monopolized. The, the forces of production are uh, owned by ever greater monopolies. That's a necessary trend to offset the falling rate of profit. That, to me, indicates that it's trending towards a final merger, and that can only be achieved by a public monopoly, i.e. socialism. Um, the private sector is more and more dependent on state subsidies, again, trending towards 100% of subsidies. That would indicate a trend towards nationalisation uh, and, again, socialism. Uh, if fiat currency is dying, one minute, uh, sort of a sort of natural death because of the devaluation of currency as a result of capitalist development, that needs to be replaced with um, a labour voucher system, the one that Marx outlined in um, um, in the critique of the Gopher program. And the reason I think you need that, rather than just sort of like everyone just working for free without some sort of um, without some sort of you know currency as it were uh you you're still gonna you're starting from as from a position where the productive forces are um situated around the around the world in certain places and we want to build a society where we're not dependent on importing things from other places in the, on the other side of the planet so you're gonna have to have a a stage where different countries are still trading now that the the character of trade would be different because under world socialism there would be no actual everyone the productive forces would be collectively owned but you you so there would be no exchange in ownership Rapid. but you still need some sort of accounting system um to and then so 
to build so each socialist state would use that period of the stage of the lower stage of communism to build up the productive forces in their countries and locally so that every region can produce for itself without having to depend on on production on the other side of the world um, which obviously creates massive social problems um, and then when you get to that stage when every region can produce for itself the centra the centrality of the state becomes increasingly irrelevant and eventually you get you get um, abundance for all and the the state is no longer necessary and you you get to that higher stage of um, communism where production is is so efficient that it's and so cheap that also the the, the sort of labor voucher system becomes uh, obsolete as well okay so let's let's uh uh let me respond to that and uh Stephen, do you want do you want to make this the the closing arguments before questions or or we'll do questions and then do closing arguments statements? um well yeah if you want to save your 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 bit for closing arguments we can do a couple questions now it's 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 up to ted ted i mean what do you want to do ted i'm happy to move on Okay, so you want to you want to do I'll respond and then we'll do questions and then you still want to do a closing statement or or, or not? Um, I'm if you don't want to do a closing statement, I'm happy not to, but I I, I can keep it short. I can okay, keep it short. we'll see how we feel after questions. All right. I guess is that okay? Can we do that? Yep. Okay. Cool. So um, great. So uh, in response to that, you know, Ted has laid out a formulation for how we get there. What that vision would look, look like, how it might function. So let me talk a little bit about the, what it means to have this idea of, as I do, of uh, communism without communists. When I say that I don't mean we as individuals not being being sympathetic to or understanding what that might mean. Rather, what I mean is out a communist party, without formal communist political power in any transitory or transitional state, talking about the kinds of experiments that is going on right now in the autonomous administration of North and East Syria, otherwise known as Rojava. This isn't 5,000 people in huts, folks. It's over 2 million people. So over 2 million people, and it was able to get started under the fog Syrian conflict, under the fog of war. They used that as that crisis as an opportunity to seize an area of northwest Syria, northwest Syria and set it up as a de facto autonomous zone. Democratic confederalism that's being practiced there, having the devolution of power entirely in the hands of those at the bottom, including the military, including the police. There are no police. Everyone is in effect the police and gets police training. Um, Ted has talked a lot about sort of counter-revolutionaries and internal dissent and what to do with people who um, are going to fight the revolutionary change that I would like to bring about. Um, my notion of a better society and how we get there doesn't require any of that. There, there will certainly be threats from without, but when you look across anarchist experiments throughout all of human history, I, I mentioned many on this call, uh, Odessa is another one in the early 1900s. There was a part of Ukraine, Ukrainian leader who did a start. Uh, maybe Ted can remind me. Starts with an M. Makovia, maybe. Does that sound right, Ted? Makanov. Was it Makanov? Makanov. Oh, there it is. Maknovia. That's it. Thank you. Um, Maknovia is another one involved millions, tens of millions of people. Um, Odessa in the Ukraine, the early 1900s. Same thing. Baja, Mexico is another one, early 1900s. Um, they didn't go through the kind of purging that Ted suggests may be necessary um, and that I would prefer not to see. If we, it's not necessary, it's not, not necessary. But when you set up a state, these things tend to happen. When you don't have the consent of the governed, and people don't come to these ideas through a shift of consciousness in which they can participate daily or at least weekly, uh, daily in terms of their relationship to one another, but weekly in terms of going to a meeting and 
making decisions with everyone else that'll actually affect their lives. What to do with surplus value? You know, Ted, we can start very simply, very practically. With workplace democracy. I know you're familiar with Dr. Richard Wolf's work. There are ways to implement this, including through regulation and legal apparatus. They do it to a certain extent in Germany already. Half the board has to be occupied by workers. Boards of every firm, 50% of the board is comprised of, of the people who work there. I mean, you can change how it is that you allocate veto power to, to whom and under what conditions, and all of that can be a part of public mission. But what are the problems, right? And I'm surprised, you know, I was hoping to hear more of this, but I'm, I'm willing to concede what my own problems are with getting to that point through MMT. I don't see any technical in terms of the economics problems with MMT. What I do see is the MMT requires using a legislative body, the country in question, as a Swiss army knife. That's very difficult when there isn't political will. That's very difficult, especially in the United States, when you don't have public financing of public campaigns. That's very difficult when it would require overhauling the budgeting process due to unnecessary changes made as a result of zombie ideas passed especially during the neoliberal. I realize that there are impediments to getting these things that I'm talking about implemented, but we don't have any other game in town. I know you think that we do, but right now, if we're serious about mitigating the existential crisis posed by climate change, we don't have time. We don't have time. And as I've argued, I don't think that the outcomes that you're advocating for, even if we did, would be desirable. Sorry, I was muted there uh, for chat. So the question is, how is MMT anarchist theory when its core principle is relying on the government? Uh, great, excellent, thank you. So first of all, as I mentioned at the start, MMT is not a, a political project in any shape, way, or form. It is not a politically theoretical project in any shape, way, or form. It's a thoroughly empirical project on which anyone can graph any number of ideologies. So to say that it's anarchist theory, it's not. Now, the great question about, well, then, why is it attractive to anarchist theoreticians and anarchist ideologues and its course principles rely on government intervention? I think I addressed this earlier, but I, I know I addressed it earlier, but I'll address it again and maybe a little bit more thoroughly just to flesh it out and drive some of the points home. Relying on the government to spend into existence resources necessary to improve the material well-being of the populace. What happened in the late 1960s, early 70s, for example, when young people had time and resources? We had a fantastically booming economy back, as we did throughout much of the, the, the period between 1934 and 1973. So this was this sort of like interlude, this anomaly in capitalism. I mean, Ted and I probably thoroughly agree that capitalism's natural state is the neoliberal model and all of its other facets, all of those characterizations. Ed happens to think that austerity is being imposed as an economic necessity. He repeats that multiple times in his book. I hope I've demonstrated that's exactly the opposite thing capitalism needs right now. I realize that there are those who think that's what it needs and that's why they want it imposed. I also realize that there are those advocating for austerity, people in positions of power, anchors, oligarchs, etc., who advocate for austerity because it benefits them, it benefits their business model. But to get back to the question, what happened in the late 60s, early 70s? Students freaked out. They rebelled against the system. They had time. They had resources. They demanded more from the system. And if the system didn't give them more, they were going, they were threatening to bring it down. They were putting incredible pressure on the system. And it didn't take that many people, something that, you know, Ted is not going to be surprised by. He's familiar with Trotsky's great uh, declarations of give me whatever number of men it was. It was some 
incredibly small. I don't need millions. I need, well, what, 4,000, 8,000, whatever it was. The difference, though, Ted, is that Trotsky had those people in public in, in positions of public utilities. There were communists in each of these public utilities so that when the revolution came, they were ready. They were already in place. We talked about trade unions. Good luck getting those people in those positions to keep the water running, lights on, et cetera. I think there are better ways to go about this. I think that we can appeal to people's sense of, wait a minute, I've always been told that we couldn't have these things because how are we going to pay for them? You're telling me that the way we pay for them is that Congress authorizes the spending and then the Federal Reserve spends the money? Yes. Just like basically, yes. Congress authorizes the spending. To be more technical about it, the Treasury spends it and the Federal Reserve generates it through keystrokes into existence. Here's the payments. The Federal Reserve is nothing more bank of banks. It is a clearinghouse. It is a storekeeper, literally, of the economy. It neither has or doesn't have dollars. That's important to keep in mind. That's a very powerful notion for the anarchist. Central bank neither has nor doesn't have dollars. It's a scorekeeper. Think of all the other things we can simply scorekeep. Could we get rid of private property? Could we get rid of surplus value? Be the two fundamental characteristics that make Capitalism, the fine capitalism, private property and surplus value. Sure, why not? Keep, keep a different score. Thanks for the question. Um, Ted, do you want to respond to that or can I I'll just go ask? I move, move on to the next question. All right, Ted, um, this is one I, I got from, uh, I wrote down from actually before the debate. Uh, isn't the anarchist conception of the ruling class more accurate than the Marxist uh, conception of uh, of uh of classes because uh, it accounts for what we see in state capitalist countries like China and the former USSR where capitalists may exist but they're actually subservient to state and state bureaucrats rather than the other way around so it's not so much the mode of production but but actually the hierarchy uh, the particular hierarchy that's the most strongest uh, at, at the time or in the context that matters so we're talking about the ruling class in socialist states. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe Sam, you're you're an anarchist. Maybe you can clarify what that what that sentence he means. Repeat that sentence, please. Um, isn't isn't the anarchist conception of the ruling class more accurate than the Marxist one because it accounts for what we see in state capitalist countries like China and the former USSR, where capitalists exist but they're subservient to the state and state bureaucrats rather than the other way around oh yeah no absolutely right so that power starts with hierarchy and coercion and then the state essentially doles it out the the state is a is an extension of hierarchy that already exists but it's a representation coercive illegitimate hierarchy that has not been consented to by those and have to live under it, who have to bear its effects. Now, are there legitimate forms of coercion? Absolutely. But they have to be, if, they're, if they can't be self-justified, they have to legitimize, they have to prove their legitimacy. The onus is on those advocating for coercion to demonstrate why that coercion is justified. So the most simple example that probably many have heard um, comes from Noam Chomsky, actually. Just, you know, a, a daughter, a parent, a crosswalk, an intersection. Child goes to run across the street. Parent grabs her hand, pulls her back onto the sidewalk. Well, the, the impetus for that coercion is self-evident. Self-evident. But other cases in which coercion is being advocated and is not being consented to require justification. And the onus is always on those we're advocating to justify the legitimacy of their action. So, so Ted, their intended actions. Here. Okay, so China's far too big a topic to really get into. <laughs> I mean, I think uh, I'm. I think it's sort of a state capitalist country at the moment. Um, I think. Um, whatever it is it's it's liberalized its economy to a great extent and that has partly largely been down to the the fact that it wanted to stop 
um, it, it needed to cooperate with capital in, in order to, to stop um, an invasion and to, to stop what happened to the Soviet Union. I think it, you know, as I say, I think it's state, a cap, state capitalist rather than socialist. So to talk about that. To, to talk about a, a ruling class in China is too complicated at the moment. But let me just say again, in a socialist state, the ruling class, in a properly socialist state, the ruling class is the is the working class. The central organs of the state, and I say the central organs of the state because again, the people as a whole make up the state, but the central organs of the state are responding to the regional organs and the regional organs are responding to the local organs and so on and so forth. They're, they're respond, you know, you need, if, if different parts of the country are going to cooperate and trade the way they need to, so that you uh, reduce um, an undersupply in one region by redistributing an oversupply from another region, that takes some planning and a central organ of planners is does that by by receiving the information from those two different economic areas or, or geographical regions and then works out what needs to be done to correct the balance or whatever it is um so as i say a socialist state would in that sense lift up um the the working class to the position of ruling class is there still some sort of hierarchy? Yes, but um, people elected, people working on the central bodies of the state should be elected and they should be subject to the power of recall. Um, the first thing we should do after a revolution is, is uh, make up a new, make a new, draw up a new constitution. That should be a democratic process involving the whole population. That's recently happened in Cuba. Nine million uh, people participated in uh, in drawing up the new constitution, which just shows you how democratic um, that country is compared to, to to most the vast majority of other capitalist countries. To, of not other capitalist countries, of capitalist countries. Um, I think that sums it up. Okay. Um, then, since you mentioned Chomsky a minute ago, I have a question here teed up uh, uh, to Sam about Chomsky, and this could probably be our last one here. So, there's a, a quote from uh, D Douglas Lane of Zero Books uh, from yesterday uh, yesterday's video that he put out. So, I'm going to read it out and let you respond. So, the American anarchist milia, whether activist, uh, lifestyle, or academic, is merely a faction within the Democratic Party. This is to be expected because despite calling themselves socialists and conceiving of themselves as the most radical participants of, of, uh, in the struggle for socialism, ever since the first international, the anarchists have been liberals. Noam Chomsky would agree. He traces his own libertarian socialism back to Humboldt, Rousseau, and Descartes. He credits, he credits the sorts of, of man's creativity down to individual freedom. While it's true that... Uh, what defines humanity, what defines a human being, is his or her, is, is his or her freedom, freedom to inquire and, and create, the individual is not the source of that freedom. Rather, it is the collective efforts of people in a group that have the potential to, to free the individual, as nobody is a rock or an island. A person is not free really just because, uh, is not free really just because the cops aren't around. True freedom Will have to, will have to be productive. It will have to be collective. It will have to aim at changing the fundamental way to act, the way to act together, to produce things the way we need, and to produce our very material interests. Who's who's the quote by? I missed that that you started with. Uh, Douglas Lane of Zero Books. He's a, a um, yeah. He's got a YouTube channel and, and a book. He's a book publisher. All right. So this. I disagree with Doug that there is some sort of inherent tension between individual liberty and collective action. I think that the two are inextricably linked and can be amplified in the same direction at the same time. In fact, we cannot have collective action for the betterment of all if we're not simultaneously liberating and maximizing personal liberty and personal freedom. Autonomy, uberalis, that I look at this, that comes first. I am an autonomous human being. I don't want to participate in your committee, no problem. I'll get on my bike, 
go to the next anarchist federation across the way. No problem. Not an issue. Okay? I don't like the way that I think it's dysfunctional. It doesn't, whatever. It doesn't mean that my federation isn't going to tr trade with your federation. It doesn't mean that our federation can't come together and create a larger autonomous zone. Actually, like, you know, as a as an end point, talk about endpoints under socialism. It's talking constitutions. I mean, there we're just, it's a fundamental disagreement. I'm not interested in constitutions. Type of future society that I hope I will see in my lifetime. I need a constitution for it. If people going together to sit down and make decisions that'll affect everyone's life, how are you, what are you going to do with the surplus value that's created? What are you going to constitute a surplus value? You know, this all might sound pie in the sky until you actually take the time to investigate the experiments that have worked. So what, now the, the, this begs the question, so what happened to them, Sam? Where are they? Well, Rojava is still around. Like all previous experiments, it was attacked by imperial and reactionary forces from without. Who was Rojava attacked by? It was all over the news. Turkey. Anyone was paying attention November, December of last year, you heard Donald Trump betrayed the Kurds in Syria. Well, who were those Kurds? They were the Kurds in Rojava that had set up this society. So they had seed land and territory. The Russians are there as a buffer force now to keep the, tur the Kurds from, excuse me, the to Turks. keep the Turks from coming in to, <laughs> to, from coming in to slaughter the rest of the population there. Um, what happened in Barcelona during the Spanish Civil War? Well, the communists turned on the anarchists, and they were also attacked by the fascist forces of Franco. Um, we see this over and over again. Uh, if you want a smaller, uh, less uh, dramatic example, you look at Chaz in Seattle right now. now. What are they being threatened? National Guard, Seattle police coming in, and on and on. I'm sure that if people can get together and sit down, they can find a way to organize their lives in a way that, to the benefit and detriment of all in a fair and just system that includes distribution rights that may or may not include private property. If there's a personal preference, I don't think we need private property. Um, I much prefer possessions, private possessions over private property. I don't think we need surplus value, especially if we spur technological innovation on practical ways. Um, so also tied into that question, I would just add this is, uh, and shout out to Yanis Varoufakis on this, because this is really something that I've, uh, came to on my own before I heard from him, but it's been further developed as a result of hearing him talk about it. And that is, you can use automation in such a way that surplus value created by automation itself in the capitalist production process, a percentage of that can be returned. So the returns of capital from capital production that is AI, big data, machine learning based, can return to the constituents who have made a contribution to that AI. What do I mean by that? Take your smartphone, for example. Right, The technology in your smartphone, most of it was taxpayer subsidized and Excuse me. Well, in the case of the United States, it wasn't. But most of it was government financed uh, technology that, in a sense, when it comes to mitigating inflation, yes, you could say that the taxpayer made a contribution, paying taxes to mitigate inflation, keep the economy afloat. It was adding value to the economy to keep it healthy. And so, but where are the dividends? Where is the return on capital for all of the technological investment that the public sector has made in smartphones. It's not there. We don't, we don't see it. When every time you use Google Maps and you're in your car, okay, where your car is in the world in that given moment is contributing to the capital of the Google Corporation because they use your location to map out, okay, here's where there's congestion. It's one of the reasons you use Google Maps, right? the directions and give me traffic updates so in little ways every time you're online in your browser and facebook you're making a contribution to the stock value of companies that you probably uh, despise in many cases right amazon google facebook where is your return where is your return on that value from autumn doesn't exist it's not there so what do we do why don't we take a certain amount of that back. It's not going to be a tax. We're not taxing them. Okay. 
and it's not taxpayer funded for all of the reasons I've already explained throughout this debate, and it's not government financed. Right, what you're right, doing right. is you're saying, this is a dividend. This is a dividend from the automation that we as a society collectively contributed to. We put it in an equity fund. We're able to distribute that into the population when every time you have an economic downturn in the business cycle, you increase the size of the distribution. Whenever you have an uptick, you dis decrease the size of the distribution to avoid inflation. It can be done. Why not? And eventually, you know what that percentage will be? And this is the way to get to what Ted is and I are talking about. All right, this ties in with Ted's argument for it. Start at 10% and it's 20%, then it's 30 50. Eventually, you are at 100% return from capital on automation. Eventually. Although I don't think AI will ever fully replace all jobs. When we get to the Turing test, which many of your listeners are familiar with, it will be you know much closer to that point than we are now. But the idea is to get as close to 100% as possible. What does that do for us? It frees us up to sit around and think of new ways to live our life. It gives us ways to talk to each other. It gives us ways to do work that that if you don't do won't lead to your your misery and suffering that won't leave you homeless or unable to eat or right, unable to feed your kids we have these solutions here okay uh all right let's quickly i mean do you guys want to do closing statements and then uh and that can that can be it I wouldn't mind just taking like a couple more questions and wrapping it up that way I, i'm sorry i need to i need to wrap it up now Okay. Yeah, I, we, I, I don't really see like the questions are kind of it's it, there's a wall of, of text there and not they're mostly people are arguing with each other in chat. So, um, so let's want to uh, leave it at that then, Ted, or or do you want to do closing statements? I'm happy to leave it there, to be honest. Yeah, I think we've been going for a while and, and we both pretty much made our closing statements along the way, right? Yeah. Yeah. OK, well, then I'll let you guys just uh, plug your uh, books or, or Twitter accounts or whatever you want. Uh, just take a minute to do that and then we can head out. All right, Sam, you can okay. go first. Sure. So I just I want to give a shout out to a couple of different organizations and do a couple plugs. One is for real progressives who is doing probably the best work of bringing MMT to the masses. A uh, big shout out to them. Folks need to check that website out, realprogressives.org. In addition, I want to. I thank Jackie Fox, who's been doing a lot of writing both on socioeconomic policy and commentary as well as cultural criticism. Jackie Fox, who brought me together with Stephen, connected me to make uh, this happen. Um, I recommend that listeners take a look at Stephanie Kelton's new book, The Deficit Myth, probably the most popular MMT economist in the world right now. Also important contributors to MMT thought are Bill Mitchell, Australia. Randall Ray, who's at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. Pavlina Cherniva, who's done the most thorough job in the world of, uh, has given the most thorough treatment of a federal jobs guarantee at Bard College. Um, excuse me, I said Randy was at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. He's also at Bard. And then um, Dr. Matthew Forstadter at his University of Missouri, Kansas City. Please check out his work, F O R S T A T E R. I mentioned Bill, I mentioned Randy Ray, Stephanie Kelton, Warren Mosler. If you want a great primer on MMT, please, Stephanie Kelton's The Deficit Myth or Warren Mosler's. You can get Mosler's book for free online right through his website if you Google this, Deadly Innocent Frauds of Economic Policy. It's a pamphlet. It's 55 pages, super fast read. It's, it's written for the layperson, and it um, will blow your mind. Thanks. Ted? Are you there? Yeah, can you guys hear me? Uh, just about. Did you? I don't. I don't know what happened. I'm assuming it's you're turning to me. Um, firstly, I'd just like to thank Sam for the debate. Um, I think it was a very healthy debate, very interesting, um, and um, maybe we can do it again sometime and uh, cover the areas we didn't. Um, you can find me on Twitter and Medium at Grossmanite. Uh, my book, Socialism or Extinction, is on Amazon um, and Kobo um, as ebooks. Um, there's also an abridged version on both, and the, there's a print version of the abridged version on, Kobe, on Amazon at the moment. 
uh, there will be a print version of the full version um, in the coming months. Okay, well, that's it. Uh, thanks, guys. Thanks, chat, for participating. And uh, yeah, have a good weekend. Thank you, Chad. Thank you Appreciate it, everyone. Thank you, Stephen.